Um, the way this shelter would work, this building would roll back on these rails and then the missile that's inside to stand up, uh, pump full of fuel and oxidizer. Behind that blast wall over there, there's a big tank over there. That's where the liquid oxygen and the oxidizer would be stored. The gaseous nitrogen tanks that you see there would pressurize that and push the liquid oxygen into the vehicle. The kerosene rocket fuel that was for rocket propellant one and stuff more high grade kerosene, that would be behind the blast wall over there. Um, here's the thing, and this is one of the reasons why this is so important for you guys to stand here. Um, because this is the only Thor launch complex left on this planet. So there were originally 60 of these that were deployed in England. None of them exist there now. So they are only basically con concrete ruins in several places. And I can tell you that there are a lot of folks in the UK that don't know that this history existed. And that's not a slight against anybody. It's just because it's one of those Cold War things that get lost in time. And that's a very dangerous thing for us is when we don't pass stories on. So we're working on preserving this to tell that story, and then we're working on a documentary film to go and preserve the story and help them with that as well. So question. Why did they get phased out? Um, when this was originally developed, it was developed as a stopgap measure. So they were taking basically the first ballistic missile, which was the first plan was Atlas. So the Atlas ICBM, 5,000 mile nautical range. And that came with a lot of infrastructure requirements. So they wanted to accelerate a development curve so they could take parts of that and then put it on a faster track that required less infrastructure. So this actually, this program, and for anyone who's had to work on an engineering project and coordinate this, this went from an idea on a chalkboard in July of 1954 to contractor selection and final engineering design authority to proceed in 50 days. Wow. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> now here's the thing, guys. When we're talking about this, they didn't have the capability to do this. So the machine capability to do the machine tooling, that was part of that too. They had to make the milling tools to be able to make the pieces so they could build the pieces, so they could build the infrastructure, so they could deliver the pieces, so they could train the people, so they could operate the pieces. That started in June of 1954, and they launched the first vehicle from Slick 2 in December of 1958. Boom. Done. And yeah, that's getting it done, right? Because that's people that believe. It was part of something that was bigger than them, and they made it happen. So they said, okay, so this went to England. Now here's the other thing. Everything you see here has to also, as part of that design, break down into a kit and go into an airplane and fly to England so somebody can assemble it from instructions and make it work. <laughs> yeah. And they did, and it was operational by February of 59. And then that system was basically buying time while the longer-range Atlas missiles were coming online. So as that happened, once Atlas came online and once Minuteman came into play, they didn't need that system any longer. So what they did is they disassembled all those pieces and brought them back to the States. And then they reused those pieces and we used them to put up spacecraft. And off of this pad, we launched those vehicles until 1980, putting up DMSP, which we still fly today, by the way. Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, DMSP. So, and DMSP, a lot of people don't know this, that was actually developed as a scheduling tool for the intelligence program. Because they were taking these mechanical spacecraft taking photographs from space. So they have a 70 millimeter camera and it's taking pictures like a player piano. Well, the problem is when you get film back, they would develop pictures and they're like, wow, the weather was bad that day. So we took a lot of really expensive pictures of the tops of clouds. So they said, okay, well, that's not helping us. Sure would be nice if we could see the ground. Yeah, if we can only forecast that, we need a weather satellite. Do we have one? Nope, but I figured it out. So they went and developed weather satellites so they could schedule the intelligence satellites to take pictures of the ground. And they said, you know, this is pretty handy. <laughs> we could use this for other stuff, too. <laughs> and, of course, we still fly DMSP today. So in Tyros N and all those things, that all evolved from that capability. And, again, they didn't have any of this when they started. So from that jump to this point, it's pretty cool. And then the fact that the vehicle that they're flying is essentially just a modern version of this, the booster, is very, very cool. Two pump shower head and a trash can. It's awesome stuff. So, so that's what this is about. Um, this is the last remaining Thor pad in the world. And, um, and launched out here. Last launch off of this pad was in July of 1980. First launch was in August. There was one Royal Air Force crew training launch from here and 31 satellites. So with that said, please watch your step. We're going to the bottleneck here. So watch for tripping hazards. This is a very historic day, um, 29th um, anniversary of the launch of our, our dear crew at uh, the Challenger. And uh, for all of us who, who were alive at that time and probably remember where they were when you found that out, um, pretty uh, a humbling moment and um, you know and I think that uh, and I posted this this morning that every mission that we do here really you know is a tribute to to the division of that so we're still a part of carrying that on 
And we have to keep the focus of that. And that's one of the things about trying to inspire people to get excited about space. Yeah. Because here's the thing, we're a part of it. That's what kills me. People think like space is something else. No, dude, you're really part of it. Okay, because we're like hurling through the vacuum of the, of the cosmic, you know, you know, energy here. You know, we're talking lots and lots of stuff happening. Chandra's recording a bunch of it. It's cool, <laughs> right? You're a part of that. You're not removed from it. And when we start to think about that, it's kind of humbling, you know. So, and that, of course, keeps us focused to say, hey, stay the course, make the missions happen, get it done. And that's what these guys were all about in the early days, being a part of something bigger than them. And when you look across the way, you see those concrete, di off in the distance, those concrete uh, blast walls. That's where they launched the first intelligence satellite for the United States. That's where they launched Corona Discover 1. So that happened out there February 28, 1959. And that was the first polar orbiting vehicle, first heavy lift vehicle, first intelligence satellite. Lots of cool firsts. The block house is actually where the radar dish is over there. That's hair radar. High accuracy instrumentation radar. And uh, that was built with leftover parts from a couple systems. 10 million watt transmitter, it's pretty cool. Um, so you can fry an egg on the moon with that, it's kind of neat. And, um, so, and then you for, of course follow around to uh, select two to the west uh, pad there. And you can see the bottom of the MST is open. You can see the gem uh, on the side of the booster for those that are, uh, can reach out that far optically. So that's so that, that MST will roll back and expose the vehicle. If we go inside, you'll see pictures of that and all like that. So, so with that said, let's do that. We're gonna go inside here. This booster, uh, this airframe, this is the Thor uh, SM-75. This is a 1959 Thor SM-75. This particular airframe was on nuclear alert in England from 1959 to 1963. The students from the 392nd Missile Training Squadron trained here at Vanderbilt Air Force Base went to, uh, to, to England. It was a joint program with the Royal Air Force and the United States Air Force. The Royal Air Force was in charge of the booster. The U.S. Air Force was in charge of the bomb. So it took both to agree, and it would go through the count if they needed to, and away it would go. So obviously that didn't happen, thankfully, and after the system came out of service, they brought all that hardware back. Here's the thing, this shelter you're standing in was also on nuclear alert in England, because the original shelter that was here was disassembled and went to Johnston Island to support another program down there. And they reconstructed this site with parts that came back from alert in England. So the building, the booster, all the stuff was at one point on nuclear alert. This booster was then modified and went to Johnson Island as part of another program called Program 437. And 437 was an anti-satellite program that they did out jo Johnson Island until about 1975. And then it came back out here. This site was modified for space launch, so this payload fairing that you see here behind you, uh, off to my, my right or left, uh, that is a DMSP fairing from the Block 5D1 that we flew out here. That was the version of the DMSP satellite we flew here. And then where you're standing is actually the clean room. So if you notice up behind you, up here, so there's a curtain that would go across there. So where that, that beam, there would be a curtain that would go there, and there was a curtain that went across back here. So the floor where it's painted would be the clean room, okay? So then this would be basically purified. They would process the spacecraft once it was sealed up. Then they would split the building. Where I'm standing, the building would split. So the shelter extension, which was added for the clean room, would move that direction. The weapon shelter would go back that way. Then the missile itself would stand up vertically, pump full, fuel, three, two, one, big fire, and away it went. That's happened 32 times from this path. So as we walk down here, we'll walk down to the back end of this thing. It's going to get narrow down here so you guys get you know, friendly and you know, make the rotation so everybody can see it. But please watch your step for tripping hazards. And then also, just to make sure that you're, you're paying attention, we have something along the wall right about like eye level to poke your eye out. So, um, so just be really careful in the darkness that you don't bump into that. Uh, we really appreciate that. I'm sure you would too. But just, so come on this way. I like the there. Mr. Hill, are you back there? <laughs> Stephanie, are you back there? Uh, sure. Nobody. <laughs> We're going to roll down. <laughs> we have no adult supervision. Woo! Okay. So, so here we have the launch mount. So, someone drops the cannon. There you Thank go. You. So, here's your launch mount. So the booster itself would sit back on these, these, these arms, basically. So these pins would be extended up into there. Three of them had threads. We have fancy names for that. We have an acronym for everything. They called that an electromechanical linear actuator, or otherwise known as an EMLA, which is a really cool way of saying electric bolt. So they would have these electric bolts extend and hold the booster to the pad. Very cool. So then this whole thing, this trailer would be attached up here to this mount. There's an actuator, a hydraulic ram that sits underneath this that attaches this whole thing together. Then when this shelter rolls back out of the way, 
this whole assembly, this trailer, the booster, the launch map, this whole thing hinges up into the vertical position. So then, I run this line here, that's where your fuel would come in. Up around through here, fill up the tapered portion of the fuel tank. The liquid oxygen line would come in from the other side. Now, I was talking about how they had to make the machining capability. So look at the cylinder, the bottom cylinder portion of this. So you see how the cylindrical shape of this tank is? That's a liquid oxygen tank. That tank was actually made out of three sheets of aluminum that were eight feet wide by 25 feet long. And they had to machine a honeycomb pattern in the back side of it and then shape it into a semicircle and then bond them together in order to make the, the cylinder itself. They didn't have machine tools to handle that tolerance for that length in 1957 or 1954 when they started this. So they had to build that capability. Then the tank ends were then bonded to that and away they went. The back of this is called the boat tail, so you have the main engine, two vernier engines to give you attitude control. And in the case of the Delta vehicle, um, you can attach the solid motors to it, so they have the fuel lines coming up at the bottom, it's called the universal boat tail. And they would attach solid motors to it so it can do two, three, four, six, or nine. Because, like, if six good, nine's better, right? You know, I mean, you know? So that's how that kind of all started. And then they said, hey, we'll keep making them taller and longer and, and wider. And, and as they did all that, they eventually ran out of space until they came up with the graphite epoxy motors, which were made out of carbon, so then they could make the, th the casing uh, thinner, which meant that they were lighter. So they said, hey, now we can put more fuel, which meant they had more power, so we can make them longer again. So they did that until they, of course, ran out of space that way. And now we have the gem that we fly on the Delta II today. So um, kind of the evolution of that. So from where we're standing, this flame bucket, 32 vehicles have fired off of this path. So 31 satellites and one Royal Air Force crew training launch in 1959. So um, that's, you know, there's, there's lots to this. Um, we, yeah, I could keep you here for two days, but I know we want to get you guys looking at the other buildings, so I hate to cut you short, but we're going to head back that way. One thing I want you to note, okay, I want you to look at this beam. Okay, look very closely at this beam. Okay, you're, you've never, you'll never see beams the same way. Okay, because that's not actually a beam. See this vertical structure here? Okay, that's what we call a bent. Because it's actually two pieces of sheet metal bent and then put back to back with a flat strap of steel on the outside edge of it. Now what that does is it gives you the torsional rigidity of an iron beam with a third of its weight. Because again, this had to break down and go into an airplane and fly to England. And you really don't want to fly iron beams in your airplane. So think of all of the pieces of the puzzle that they had to solve in that 50-day time frame to make this a reality. That's getting it done. So, so next time someone tells you that they can't do something, tell them, uh, wrong. Okay? Your attitude is wrong. Change it. Let's go forward. Okay, so that head towards the door. Head